Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's the way Missouri sounded just after the Civil War. Wind through elm trees. Wind through long grass. Wind blowing up the dust and puffing it down the wagon road. And listen again. Another Missouri sound. A rope. A new rope freshly purchased at a crossroads store and cut into six equal lengths to support six bodies of approximately equal size. By neck. Six bodies, six Missouri boys in Union uniforms, newly come home from the war, waylaid by Cole Younger and his brothers, who were on a perpetual rampage until they were stopped. So tonight, my report to you on the Younger brothers, why some of them grew no older. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, teller of murders. Now once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. Before the Civil War, there was a border war. The boys from Kansas took gun to hand and shot up the boys from Missouri. And the next Saturday night, vice versa. It got so they didn't wait till Saturday night. Every day was bloody day for everybody. The question now arises, why? The answer is simple. A difference of opinion about slavery. And they couldn't wait till war was declared. Raid and pillage and slaughter in bloody colors smeared on in bold brushstrokes. And one day, through this never-never land of pistol and knife and torch, there walked a young man. His name was Cole Younger. He was leading a horse and buckboard. And when he came to a certain shack by the road, he was at the end of his journey. People around saw he wasn't armed, so they let him through. They saw his face and the look in his eye, and they let him through. Ain't you learned to knock on a door, Sonny? You're Mr. Quantrell, ain't you? I admire politeness in young men. You try knocking... My daddy's dying on a buckboard outside. You come see. I seen dying, Sonny. You come see. All right. He's dead, Sonny. I'm sorry. Shot him while he's standing there just talking to him. Just saying why were they on his land. Shot him because he raised his voice to them. Kansans? Jayhawkers from Kansas. North boys. What are you needing, Sonny? A burying for your daddy? A burying's a private thing, and it's a thing I'll do myself, Mr. Quantrell. When are you riding into Kansas to kill you some Jayhawkers? Tonight, maybe. After I bury my daddy, maybe? Soon after that. I'm coming with you. Of course you are. Not right after he buried his daddy, but soon after... Cole Younger had to take an oath before he became a member of Quantrell's Raiders. It was called the Black Oath, black being the color Quantrell admired most, since it suggested death and danger. The candidate was placed between four men clothed in black, wearing hideous masks representing the devil. First, these men clattered long, keen swords together, then pointed one at the candidate's throat, one at his heart, one at his arms, one at his feet, while the oath was spoken. The purpose of war is to kill. I will fight because I want no other occupation. I will tear down, waste, and despoil my enemies. By the powers of darkness here under the black arch of heaven's avenging symbol, I pledge and consecrate my heart, my brain, my body, and my limbs to exterminate Federals, 
jayhawkers and their abettors. And if I fail in my oath, may an unmerciful devil tear out my heart and roast it over flames of sulfur. Well, by the time war came, Cole Younger was two years older. He was Quantrell's first lieutenant. This rise from the ranks because he was a smart lad, a reader of books, a blower up of ammunition trains, a burner down of farm buildings, a pillager par excellence, a murderer meticulous in that he only shot males, and mostly always from the neck up. An exception to this last was the time in Lawrence, Kansas, in a bar on Christmas Eve. And I offer you a drink, one and all, so step up to the bar. And you're my friends, one and all. Ain't that so, Billy? Billy! (laughs) Drunken friend, Billy. You sleep so sound, Billy. And don't you too, Johnny. You sleep because you got no sleep at Shiloh. Tell them how it was at Shiloh, should I? Listen, all of you, all around. Yank. You step right up and have a drink, courtesy of me and Bill and Johnny and the Union Army. Yank. Huh? What you doing around these parts? Sent us out here to get us Quantrell. What's your name? Martin Wallace Martin. A sergeant from the stripes on your uniform. And my drunken friend Billy's my corporal You've seen a lot of killing, ain't you? Didn't you hear? We were at Shiloh. Were you brave at Shiloh? Huh? Brave. Like you are now. What are you talking about? Talking a street just before you're going to die. You ain't too tall a fella to be tall. Billy? Corporal Billy, wake up. Now you come on, open your eyes, Bill. You see this, Bill? Johnny, Yankee Johnny, (laughs) you're a bright one, up and ready. (laughs) Why are you shivering, Johnny? Why are you shivering so? Merry Christmas to one and all. Younger, aren't you? Uh, yeah, but what's the idea all you, you men busting in here? Vigilantes. What you won't hear. Cole Younger's your brother, isn't he? Yeah. Where and... is he? He ain't here. Where is he? Fighting a war. Shooting three men down, two of them sleeping, ain't fighting a war. Where is he? I told you. Pinkert! Throw that rope over that rafter. Where's your brother, John? Look, I... I don't know where cold is. Texas, maybe. Louisiana, maybe. All I... right, man. <clears throat> you want me to holler. You want me to scream mercy. Well, hang me and see if I do it. All right. All right, John. Uh, you're, you're biting a lip when I put the noose around your neck, but that ain't hollering, is it, John? And drawing it tight. You ain't hollering either. Where are you hiding coal? All right, Pinkett. Let him down. Uh, loosen the rope a little, John, so you can holler. Or tell me where coal is. You're right before I tell you. You're <laughs> Right before I tell you. Regular brother to coal, ain't you? Try me. I just tried you. The end of a rope. A dozen of you did that. One at a time. Take it! Wait. 
All right. All right. We'll wait. You're going to kill me. I, I got to say something. I got to tell you about Cole. Why, if you were licking his boots, you'd be in the right relation to him. He's fighting for what he knows in himself. Is right. Approach your brother isn't a bloodletter and. Ah! I kick her, are you? That, that's good. That's very fine. Because now you'll kick high ones and low ones in the air all around. Pinkett! But they didn't hang him until he was dead. They hung him till just before he was dead and then let him down and beat him up and left him. But they didn't find out where Cole was and that spunky brother of his knew all the time where Cole was. In the hills, not two miles away. Down the road and through a pass and up a hill and two miles away. Hi, John. They came looking for you, Cole. They tried to kill you. Did a thing with a rope. Here. Thing like that, and you didn't say a word, did you? I'm coming along with you, Cole. From now on. That's good. listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. Captain Kennelly of CBS Radio's 21st Precinct called to remind us that the station house will be shut down this Friday night while the program moves. Beginning next Wednesday, at a somewhat earlier hour on most of these same stations, 21st Precinct will join Crime Classics, Crime Photographer, and the rest of your Wednesday Star's Address dramatic thrillers. Listen for the 21st Precinct a week from tonight at its new time. And now once again, Thomas Highland in the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on The Younger Brothers, why some of them grew no older. On April 9th, 1865... General Lee surrendered, and the war was over. A thing happens when a war is ended. A pall hangs over the land, and then suddenly there is a maelstrom of activity. Returnings, accountings of gains and of losses, dead battles fought again on saloon tables, lost legs bragged about the blinded eye, the maimed arm, the victory ball and the brain shocked from its moorings and adrift. And finally the bright young men funneling into the area of sorrows and devastation to sell, to cheat, to build. Which was Missouri in 1866? Six of them Yankees, cool. (laughs) And one shot scared them. All right, men, get them! That don't look like none of them are armed, cool. Yeah. Who's speaking for these men? I be. Who are you? What the six of you doing riding here? I ask you the same question. Well, what's 50 of you doing stopping us? There must be 50 of you. I'm Cole Younger. That one over there is John Younger. That's my brother, Jim. And Bobby's... The Younger boys, huh? That's right, mister. I hear you believe the war ain't over. (laughs) Guess you believe like me. Else why are you riding in uniform? Well, you're not a simple man from what I heard, Younger. You know why we're uniformed. We're riding to Indians. John. Who? Oh. Hang them, John. In the name of heaven, you, you wouldn't hang the six of us. John. Who? Oh.
The wind and the rope. You remember. Cole Younger and his brothers hanged six soldiers. You might ask how come Bob and Jim Younger were with Cole and John all of a sudden. Well, they were. After the war, there was a reunion, and the four of them decided to cast lots together, as the saying goes, to join forces, to butter their bread all on one side. Anyhow, for the next ten years, the brothers Younger robbed and killed and burned. John Younger was shot down by a detective in St. Clair and was buried near there. Then, on the 7th of April, 1876, in a shack on the skirts of Northfield, Minnesota. It's them, Cole. All right, Bob, open the door for them. Come on in, boys. Hi, Jesse. Hello, Cole. You met my brother Frank, haven't you? Sure, everybody knows everybody. James boys, Jess and Frank. Cole. Uh Uh-huh. You told your boys how we're going to do that bank. Don't you worry about it. I ain't worried about nothing, Cole. I just asked you a question. Don't worry, Jess. They'll do what they got to do. They'd better. Everything ready? Sure. Town people having that political meeting like you said they would be? Yes, I know. Then we don't have to wait for nothing. For nothing at all. money in that bank. That's good. Me and Frank talking about retiring for a little while. Going to Mexico. Hey. Huh? Sniff. What are you smelling, Cole? Too empty. Yes. Just said too empty, that's all. You and me, just Bob and Frank. Rest of you, wait. Take up, mister. Just slide everything you got through the window. Back of the window, Jess. See, he's not cheating. All the money, ma'am. And don't scream. Just don't scream. Not the silver, mister. Silver's too heavy to carry. Come on, come on. How you and Frank doing, Bob? Good, good. Let's get out of here. Come on, Bob. Frank. Okay, boys. Now, just don't gallop till we turn the corner. All of us galloping might disturb that meeting that... What's the matter, Cole? Too empty. Like I said. Nothing to shiver about, Cole. There's a meeting. Plan kind of empty. That's what these streets are. Look there, boys. Run! Run! The bank robbery at Northfield was the turning point. The instant that the townspeople, instead of being at a meeting, had formed a posse and ambushed the outlaws, the bringers of terror became fugitives. The younger brothers had never turned tail and run before, nor had the James boys. But some loop in time, some coordinates of chance, conspired that they retreat at exactly the same moment. At darkness, they lost their pursuers, but they kept riding. It was not until almost midnight that they found a hiding place. How's uh, your arm, Bob? Hurts. Lucky we got away, ain't we, Cole? We haven't done it yet. Jim hurt bad. Ain't riding no more. Dying? Maybe. Cole. Yeah? Jess is fuming. I walked over in the clearing a minute ago. Him and his brother was teasing with Jim. Take us a walk. Hi, Jess. Just looking at your brother here. Marveling. Oh? How's he staying alive? Not bothering you, son? Well, I'll tell you, Cole. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Jesse? You talking at me, Bob Younger? Tell my brother Cole what you've been saying about Jim. 
I've been saying, Cole, your brother Jim be better off dead. Better for a lot of people. Like who? All of us. So we can get on our horses and start riding. How long do you think it's going to take that posse to catch up with us? The truth is, Jesse, I haven't thought about that. Well, now, just you think about it. Jim can't ride, Jess. That's what I've been saying. What do you think we ought to do with him? Leave him. Oh? Or shoot him. I'd shoot him. Jess? Uh Uh-huh. You're a dog, Jesse. Oh? You think so, huh? I'll tell you what else I've been thinking. Tell me, Cole. Tell me real fast so you can get it out. Thinking how it would be we drew on each other. Be pretty with me. Want to try? Be pretty with me. Stop! Stop it! You two loco killing each other? That's what had happened, you know it. What do you think, Jesse? I think maybe your brother Bob is right. But you want to try. Here I am. You get going, Jesse. You gonna stick around for a posse? Maybe. Just you get going. Not because you're saying it. Because I think it's a thing to do. Come on, Frank. Jim. Can you hear me, brother? Your smiling makes me know you can. Now, don't you talk. Coolness to your head. Don't you worry. Nobody's going to leave you. We're going to take care of you, Jim. Get a doctor to you. Somehow they eluded the posse from Northfield, and Jim got stronger, and they rode. There were four of them, Cole Younger and his brothers Jim and Bob, and a man named Charlie Pitts. Across Minnesota they rode and into Iowa, and now there were posses everywhere, some numbering a thousand men. And they couldn't catch the Younger brothers. Rewards and promises by bankers and sheriffs and governors, and they couldn't catch the Youngers. The brothers, as far as anyone could tell, were headed into Missouri. But no one could catch them. And once... I think I got one of them, Cole. And me too. I think there was only two. You cover me, I'll go make sure. <laughs> Thought I'd got you before, Sonny. Not my pride. Uh, guess me and my brother both got him. You hurt bad? Crazy to try to ambush us. Only two of you, son. Reward. What are they offering for us? Thousands. I don't know. And you and your partner wanted to kill the younger brothers. Everybody. They all out after the younger brothers, huh? Everybody. Mm -hmm. You hurt? Hurt. You didn't deserve better, kid. Two of them, Cole? Mm, like you said, kids. Hm. Kids. How old are you, Brother Bob? <laughs> yeah. It's a long way. Bob, get out! Oh. Must be hundreds of them keep shooting, Bob. Charlie, I'll go look after Jim. Oh, you hit! Just keep shooting. And at last they were surrounded. Charlie Pitts was killed almost at once, but the younger brothers held off a hundred men for hours. Finally... Right out! Right out! Shot the pieces! And they truly were shot to pieces. Cole had been shot 11 times with one rifle ball under his right eye. Jim had eight buckshot and one rifle ball in the body, plus the shattered jawbone he'd received at Northfield. And Bob's arm was practically macerated. So they were captured, 
Seven years of plunder, hate, and murder. Done now. The younger brothers leashed. Finally. They were tried and sentenced to life imprisonment in the penitentiary at Stillwater, Minnesota. Several newspapers tried to get Cole Younger's story, and here is a copy of the letter which he wrote to one of them. Dear sir, without intending the least disrespect, permit me to say, positively I will have nothing to do with writing a history of any kind. As for anything since the war, a true statement would fall flat. I look upon my life since the war as a blank, and will never say anything to make it appear otherwise. The world may believe what it pleases. I have nothing to say unless it would be a request, using the language of Othello. Speak of me as I am, nothing extenuate, nor set down aught in malice. I was a soldier and fought to hurt, but I never molested a non-combatant. Truly yours, Coleman Younger. Bob Younger died in prison in 1889. Jim and Cole were released after 25 years. In 1902, Jim committed suicide in a hotel room in St. Paul over an unrequited love. Cole lived until 1916. A quiet life. He sat on a front porch in Lee's Summit, Missouri, and whittled and rocked and talked to hardly anyone at all. But he thought a lot. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. The Younger Brothers, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed by Bernard Herman and conducted by Lud Gluskin, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Jack Edwards was heard as Cole, Sam Edwards as Bob, and Jimmy Eagles as John Younger. Featured in the cast were Barney Phillips, Clayton Post, Bill Bissell, and Walter Tetley. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, South Konkan, India, in the spring of 1856. We will concern ourselves with two brothers. Their names were Kanak and Supan, and they despised each other. It's listed in my files as... How Supan Got the Hook Outside Bombay. Thank you. Good night. Two more familiar CBS radio headliners have moved. This Friday night on most of these stations, where you've been accustomed to hearing stage struck, the star's address now brings you the new Friday night full-hour Arthur Godfrey Digest show, bringing you Arthur and all the little Godfreys back to nighttime radio with a bang. As for stage struck... This fine, full-hour visit with Broadway shows and Broadway folks will be presented Sundays at the Star's Address from now on. Thursday night's Marlena Dietrich stars in Time for Love on the CBS Radio Network.